Welcome to the Alice Paul Center podcast series, bringing you the latest in gender, sexuality, and queer scholarship and practice. I am Maria Murphy, Interim Associate Director of the Alice Paul Center. Today I'm joined by the first Abrams Artist in Residence here at APC, Ricardo Bracho. Artists in Residence are outstanding visual artists, musicians, writers, and other creative practitioners who work with students and faculty. And I am thrilled to speak about some of Ricardo's outstanding creative practice today. Ricardo is a writer, editor, and teacher who has worked in community and university theater and video and film, politics and aesthetics for the past 29 years. He has held other academic appointments, including at the Theater School at DePaul University in Chicago, an artist scholar in residence at the Center for Chicano Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. His award-winning plays, which include The Sweetest Hangover, Sissy, Puto, and Mexican Psychotic, have been produced in Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco, as well as workshopped and staged nationwide. His focus in community has been on social justice, public health, and the arts with queer and trans youth of color, Latina and Latino, high-risk populations, queer men of color, and incarcerated men. In addition to his residency at the Alice Paul Center, Ricardo is affiliated faculty in the Latin American and Latino Studies program. This spring, on April 2nd, at the Slot Foundation here in Philly, he will be presenting a stage reading of his new work, Circa, a work that ruminates on urban intentional communities as part of attempts to live in solidarity in alignment with shared principles and resources. Joining me in interviewing Ricardo today is Lucas de Lima. Lucas is the author of Wetland Action Books and the chapbook Terraputa, Birds of Lace. His writing has appeared in Pen Poetry, Poetry Foundation, Boundary 2, Apogee, and Brooklyn Rail. He is a doctoral candidate here at Penn and the recipient of fellowships from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and the Charlotte uh, W. Newcomb Foundation. His most recent manuscript is Tropical Sacrifice, a dreamlike prophetic narrative based on the spiritual journey of a chicken, an animal typically used for sacrificial rituals in Afro-Brazilian religion. A re-enchantment of his mixed-raced ancestry, the chicken becomes a point of access to genocidal and ecocidal histories, opening an ancestral portal to indigenous, Afro-diasporic, and non-human worlds. I'm thrilled to speak with both of you today and think through how performance and creative writing are part of cultivating community and perhaps um, the way I like to think of things as, you know, performatively enacting the better worlds that we are imagining. So thank you both so much for, for meeting with me today. Maybe I'll start with the the question that I constantly think about, Ricardo, when I'm thinking about your work, which is basically why performance? Why is performance one of your main, you know, a medium of choice? What does it afford you or your ideas or your audiences or the communities that you're imagining engaging with your work? Well, for me, it's been mainly theater, sort of in, and community-based theater as opposed to I mean, I have had a play off Broadway, um, but whatever. But mostly it's been in queer, feminist, Latino, and sort of local community-based theater companies. I think really it's two things, and it's arrogance and politics. Like that part of being a writer who puts things in the world is that you believe that what you have to say is worthy of other people subjecting other people to. And that I wanted... I wanted to have public discussions of I- of ideas I had and things I think I thought people should should be thinking about or should think like I think. <laughs> that to be flat about yeah that, sure. that that is why. So it hasn't been performance as as theorizing performance studies. It's been pedantic and literal. <laughs> but maybe I'm moving away from that because I no longer write plays as such. So Circa mm-hmm. is the last sort of looking like a play on the page play that I will write. Even though I'm going to make things that have characters in it, they're also not going to have much plot, and they're going to be interrupted by other forms of performance which aren't narrative, so like film and dancers and fun naked body. Yeah, I was wondering what this what the seed is for you when you start writing, um, as in, you know, what kind of sparks you to begin on a project and how it comes about. I think for me... I was really excited about just like how voracious your work is and all the references. And I was wondering what your process is and, you know, in terms of like where you're pulling from and how that shapes the form as well. Maybe you could speak to how this transition that you're making from writing plays to other work. Sort of even in the plays that I've written, I think they are about a dozen full length and maybe like five short ones. 
I've, no, I've never wanted to write the same play twice, which is the wrong attitude to have in American theater because you're always supposed to write a well-made play, two acts. It can be... Although they prefer tragedies to comedies. And, they, you know, it's usually... If it's going to be a Latino play, it's going to be a family with secrets. <laughs> you know, and in that kind of telenovela baroque explosion of them on stage is a little tiring, although I love reality television. Um, so I like it in that form better, I guess. But not in sort of subscriber based theater model. Um, so I was never I never want to write the play in the same way. And I tend to work on two plays at once because because so that you don't so not every idea goes into one place. I think that happened early on, like my first play, like every single thing I thought is in that one play. Because I thought like, oh, this is gonna, this is my one shot. And I had in that one, I had written like the grant, the creative work fund, which I applied for. You had to submit 10 pages of a play in progress. But really, all I had was 10 pages. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, snap, now I have to write a play. And then that was sort of like suturing poems and scenes I had written um, over a long time into sort of a semi-coherent narrative based in, like, San Francisco's underground house world of the 90s. And then, you know, kind of you get better at it, but I've never gotten, you know, I've t- taken a lot of classes with Sri Moraga. I've taken some classes with the late Irene Fornes and some with Caridad Svitch. And and critically, I guess, for the sort of leap out, I had a residency with Mabu Minds, where I wrote a silent play, which is projected text and silent film action. And so each one I wanted to be different. So Circa, I wanted... The scenes to be, the scenes are, it's my first sort of naturalistic or expressionist. It's sort of like happens in real time. And the scenes are, like the acts are all one scene. So it's really these long, extended, you know, the, the pace is like breathing. All the music cues happen with the people on stage, make them. And that was written at the same time, or begun, with Puto. And those, and Puto's, there are, there are scenes in Puto that are like half a, half a page long. They're very clipped. They're very short. They're very cinematic because there's, it's about somebody on the run and it's like someone in a panic and navigating through a dystopic police state. And instead of, you know, this sort of like communal sort of relaxed life that Circa tries to approximate in its circa Can you talk a little, can you sort of set the scene what Circa's about uh, in a little more detail? Yes. Circa, about, approximate, sometime in the past, East Hollywood, Thai Town, Little Armenia, rent stabilization, where the hood meets the hills, an urban intentional community or commune, an attempt to live in solidarity in alignment with shared principles and resources to break bread and conventions mandated by family, state, and capital. Circa, a new play by me, Ricardo A. Bracho, set in a rent-stabilized apartment complex between become urban intentional community in the recent past in East Hollywood. Now, I know that you all children don't know who Josephine Baker is, but you ask Grandma and Grandpa, and they will tell you. You know what they will say? Why, she was a devil. And you know something? Why, they are right. I was, too. I was a devil in other countries, and I was a little devil in America, too. Josephine Baker, the March on Washington speech, 1963. Yes, I believe that there is a multiple people, a people of mutants, a people of potentialities that appears and disappears. I don't know, perhaps I'm raving, but I think we're in a period of productivity, proliferation, creation, utterly fabulous revolutions from the viewpoint of this emergence of a people. Felix Watari, as quoted by Sueli Rolnik, preface to the seventh Brazilian edition of their Molecular Revolution in Brazil. It is better to make new mistakes than repeat the old ones to the point of unconsciousness. Jakar Sonki, epigraph to Rainer Werner Fassbinder's Katzelmacher. A foreigner especially someone from the South who is supposed to enjoy great sexual potency. Fassbinder's definition of a Katzelmacher, as reported by Tony Raines. And so so those are sort of the the texts I was drawing on, to go back to your question, um, about sort of how things come together. In Puto, I was very much engaged with Freud's sort of one political essay, um, which is called In a Time of Love and War, and it's his... um, Right on the eve of World War One, which he opposed, um, and it was very unpopular to oppose that war, and he did that next to um, the Red Army faction's statement on the so, and theorization of the urban guerrilla. They were a, a, a terrorist organization in West Germany, um, referred to as the Bader Meinhof or the Bader Meinhof Gang, because um, Ricky Meinhof is someone I think about every day. 
Um, she was probably the pen if Andreas Bader was the sort of mouth of that piece. Um, and it's just about the urban guerrilla concept, about because Puto is very much about that. Um, so there's always texts that I'm engaging. I'm always like, you know, throwing my hand in to like some argument. I guess in Circa, I'm, I'm fighting against both um, sort of the, the ease of ethnic particularity when confronted with a state that totalizes race when it interpolates you. And I'm doing a critique of sort of how the discourse of the commons has currently come up in academia, but it's been decleaved from its Marxist roots. Um, and I'm a, you know, a Marxist in the first and last instance, so I'm always going to be like, well, hey, he wasn't making a metaphor. It was something about something people actually did in, yeah. you know, feudal England. That brings up so many of the questions that I wanted to okay. touch on, but maybe one that I'm really, really interested in, um, given, you know, how your work really precedes so much of the current moment, but also I think challenges it. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the first play that I read or um, from the... 1997, is that when it was produced, Sweetest Hangover? Um, and then uh, thinking about, this is in, it's, I think it's in Circa, is it Zoraida? Uh -huh. Who says, no, I don't hate all white people. I did in the 90s, but I'm over that. It's just <laughs> dot, dot, dot. And I have so many of my own ideas about how your work does challenge the current moment and the current discourse, um, perhaps among, you know, what's being, what's circulating now in the culture and what is being taken up and celebrated as representation and inclusion and diversity but maybe you could speak to how you're you, you're responding to the moment now or how you see your own trajectory fit or not fit into yeah i don't really know that i fit i know that i've sort of i don't know if it i, I know i broke up with the american theater or it, maybe it broke up with me i don't know we're no, we're no longer on speaking terms <laughs> although i'm excited to make theater in pennsylvania in, in philly that isn't like that I, I guess you know and isn't this sort of um constant sort of recourse to like inclusion I don't really care I'm, I, I, I was talking to Arian Wilkerson who's a dancer I'm collaborating with and who's going to play um, in circular reading he's going to dance the spirit of a shark who has come here on the middle passage but is now riding a bus that passes by the apartment building um, which sort of interrupts the linear narrative of the play and does a dance and it's beautiful and goes away and I was saying that he was talking about um like in relationship to like writing these grants and dealing with you know nonprofit theater organizations, like talking about himself and the work he does is marginal. And I was like, oh, you're the center of wherever you are, and I firmly believe that. Um, so I don't, I don't feel marginal to anything. I don't want. To, I, I, I'm included where I am. <laughs> so, um, and you know, I don't, and I mean that in just the sort of facticity of it. <laughs> um, so I don't really care for the other thing. Well, this was something else that Lucas and I were were both, something we both really appreciate your, about your work is that there's some discussions that you, it's not even that you're swerving away from, like you're just not even going there. So like these sort of questions of, you know, some of the rep politics of representation that get a lot of airtime mm -hmm. um, in our current political climate, you know, you don't even go there. Like we were talking about the question of respectability politics, which you also seem to just, you don't engage some of these more superficial, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess like renderings of identity or, you know. Yeah, I'm not very on trend, also because I'm old. Mm -hmm. So I also, I, and I'm not on Twitter. So I don't, <laughs> I mean, so those two things I think do, I mean, and also I'm having maybe like, you know, I'm having, um, you know, as a historical materialist, I'm having conversations with a sort of wider, a, a, a wider sense and deeper sense of history than sort of the yes. up to the minute um, that the, being in the 21st century allows. One of my students was trying to convince me that the past was 2010. And I was I, I was like absolutely not the, the past. <laughs> to me, the past is the late nineteenth century. <laughs> I mean, that's when I yeah. sort of the earliest like, past we can identify. Yeah, that's where I go to. Like, oh, like because I've been e researching like the California mission system. Um, so mm. like that, like so that's where I like you know I can endeavor into like you know into the archive. I mean, I know I know people who do you know much earlier, in looking at codices and you know. 17th and 18th century racist tract. Um, but, I mean, where I go is, like, the late 19th into the 20th. I'm from the 20th century. I can't help it. I'm 50 years old. What are you going to do? 
But at the same time, I don't know. I want to argue with you about that because you do puncture like the, the discourse in these certain ways. Like um, also in Circo, when there's like the two characters are asking, "You want to go to Target later?" Sure. Which one? Black Target? Not too far. Gay Target? <laughs> Not too gay. Um, it's a very brief, but there are moments I really appreciated where you know there's a kind of a nod and a wink to like what's happening, but just kind of undoing yes, it as yes. well, unraveling. But also it. that that you know. Um, LA is a very racially and economically segregated place, um, and there is, you know, the, the black target is <laughs> is off of Crenshaw, the gay target is in WeHo, and the Filipino target is in Eagle Rock, like a sort of middle class Filipino neighborhood. So, like, and those are, and they live sort of, you know, in driving distance between all three. So that's just like I mean, maybe you shouldn't say that those things are those things and that is the kind of respectability thing yeah I don't really like I don't ever care to be shocking like if I mean to be I just think that for one that's how people talk um Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah it's speaking to a lived reality as well as just like yeah and um and I don't choose to be self-conscious about that and also that is sort of you know California is a very racial state (laughs) and I mean that capital R and capital S so that is very much on everyone's mind um, in the city ha- that has, you know, the world's the world's largest county jail population, so that hovers and that eventually, you know, matters in the play. We won't give away the other strand. I think of your work um, and kind of figuration, I guess, figure that I also see continuity with the moment now. And again, maybe this continuity is just like clubbing, recreational drug use, these things that are suddenly like really big and you know. Particularly, I guess, like gay, the gay world, I mean, queer I world. It, it and, never has gone away, <laughs> but it's it's certainly like flourishing more now than it has. I think in the past few years. Mm-hmm. Um, well, in different ways of talking, talking about the role of sort of recreational drugs and mm-hmm. the way you know you're on grinder talking about chem sex or whatever, like yeah, or you know, just a range of things. <laughs> <laughs> talking For about chem sex, yes. I mean, just a range of things like ec- ecstasy, shrooms. Like I would say, anyway, based on yes. anecdotal experience, that like yes. it's way more common, and also just clubbing, like the amount of like clubbing that's happening in New York right now, um, and I globally, really, the kind of like queer parties that are happening. I know everyone is in mourning about the place in Berlin. What is it? Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, cocktail, cocktail de more. Yeah, it's true. Great, great party. I think it's one of the best, actually. Maybe the best. Um, even though Berlin is obviously an entirely different world from the world of your of your uh, work. But um, could you say a little bit how you know clubbing and anything else like that reinformed your work? Well, just you know, I don't, and I haven't dipped into it yet in Philly. Although I hear there's this party called Dust Bunnies. Oh, I don't know. That's I've in heard. North Philly. That's like this really great underground club. Um, and my niece. Bianca, uh, who goes, whose DJ moniker is Bianca Oblivion, has like hooked me up on Instagram, of course, with a local DJ. She's a DJ um, who has a couple residencies in LA and goes to Europe fairly regularly. Um, so it's now generational in my family, which is awesome. <laughs> you know, and I was like a child club kid in, not in that sort of New York stacked heel um, Michael Alleg kind of way but just like there were underground parties and you could go to them because they were underground you didn't need an ID um, and there was a sort of heyday of that in, and also punk and that was everyone thinks that like punk hated disco disco hated punk but the thing that connected them both were like um, gay boys and fashionable girls <laughs> <laughs> and you know dating the same boys with like you know who always had 40 ounces of beer and dirty black fingernail polish <laughs> But we're fun, um, and so like that was something like I had in high school and after high school in LA, and then went to the Bay Area, and that was the time of raves, and raves were this incredibly like useful global um, explosion of like pl- you know pl- pl- like pl- pleasure without nihilism in a moment that was you know the AIDS crisis in full swing. Um, and also, you know, a real, you know, that was also the time when, you know, only queers were taking care of our own in terms of lesbians, you know, um, you know, solidarity and, and just pure caretaking of gay men in that time period. But then, the, you know, raving was everybody. It was, you know, and it was also like in San Francisco, it was, you know, 
Japanese and South African and Irish and French, like everybody, and people who were going to Goa, because there's like a big rave scene in Goa. Who knew? And then that got me into sort of working in house clubs, a very famous one. It's at the end of the the Tales of the City. They go into the end up. It's this gay bar in South of Market that's still there. I worked the door um, for a couple of years at a party called Fag Fridays that happened on Friday nights with my friends David Peterson and Jose Mineros ran um, for many years there. Um, and then I also worked Sundays um, for a shorter time, which is their ongoing tea party. Right. Like that's like where you see like Grace Jones would show up. Um, that just had this long history, like in in art world, um, in leather world, and in house world, and just that music, you know, is also is is my beat, you know, is my pulse. So it's not like other people, you know. Famously, August Wilson, you know, the jazz riff is sort of how his monologues are structured. But give me like a four to the floor disco or house beat um, with, you know, because also I love the way the the beat and its propulsion is often in like a sort of critical and dialectical tension with these the lyrics that are always about longing, um, that are always... Um, very sort of conceptual and emotional at the same time um and that um you know don't seem like they would be necessarily like if you put, if you put them on the page as a poem they don't sound like a good time but then you know with you know hundreds of nearly naked people it's great well there's i mean part of the the clubbing culture the you know the mention of poppers how long the length of a kiss is in your works or you'll describe someone's tattoo or um you know the mention of the you know pornographic sounds you know or, or what in in circa or maybe uh, i'm giving too much away you you know you think it's a pornographic sound but it's actually just you know people yeah. who are hooking up um but you have this way of like just tantalizingly describing um, the sensorial in sort of every aspect of the word. And it is it is really remarkable to me to take a piece of writing, because I have not had the opportunity to see one of your shows live. Another reason I'm looking forward to April, but you do, the, the text does leap off the page. Um, and I think you do really capture the sort of material, sensorial, bodily, um, you know, experiences that you're articulating. It's just such affective writing, Um so I'm just wondering, like, you know, how is it that your writing makes my t- my skin tingle? Is it? Am I projecting? Is it? Is I'm trying to make I, I, this about me? But I mean, this is what. Let's. Yeah, no, let's not. <laughs> but you know, can you talk about like that style, that approach, or you know, I don't know that this is something you could ever teach to another creative writer, but it to me, I do feel like it. There's something very unique about, or unique about the way that you articulate these things? Well, I am teaching creative writing right now, and I did try to do this exact exercise with <laughs> oh. them. And it is about, uh, I asked them to so to do a thing them, themselves or a character, because I always sort of give, give yourself the, the cover of character, even if you're using your own name. Um, and feel free to lie. I don't think, you know, memoirs are accurate in any mm-hmm. way. And then they um, chart a journey, even whether it's from, like, you know, their bedroom to the classroom, but using only one sense. So everything you see, everything you touch, everything you smell, everything you taste, um, everything you hear. Um, so that is, I think, in, like intentional and somewhat mechanical. And then um, I think once you sort of do that with any kind of discipline or regularity, then it becomes sort of intrinsic to the writing. So I don't necessarily like stake out to do that. I know that in Circa, because it happens in the courtyard um, and it happens in a time period where there was drought in California. So it, everyone's outside. People don't wear a lot of clothes in that time of year. It's right next to Griffith Park. So like if you're going on a hike, you're not going to be wearing pants. So like there's an ex- there's exposure there that you can see someone's tattoo. Right. Um, you know, th- you know, everyone's belly button is like, you know, something that is seen. And also because they're living, you know, in sort of that enclosed courtyard. You know, the descriptions of like, oh, this because like you just see a lot of body. <laughs> um, so I think that that is sort of organic to its context. Sure. But the other thing is intentional that like I want I want it to be a bodily experience. Um, but not sort of the way in which we have been talking 
in academe of late about the body as this sort of separate category of analysis, but because I think the body is also where the theory happens. Oh, for and sure. Where the, and where the politics are happening and where they're, you know, they're struggling um, with, like, truth and sexuality. Um, and it's always never who you think it is going to be, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was thinking maybe a lot about, I guess, the questions that were circling around in terms of just, like, I was thinking about personhood in your Mm -hmm. plays and your work and how that plays out. And I thought about the word permeability. And maybe it also speaks to the process that you wrote about, that you just described in terms of pulling from all these different texts and um, of different genres and disciplines. Yes, I, like, I want it to be, I want, I want the, I I believe in being entertaining. Like, I am a, populist in that way and I think that people can enter on very many levels so I can have a even though I'm like saying I'm having a conversation with Hegel which is not something I do normally but like (laughs) I do think that his tripartite formation of subjectivity is valid for character construction say a subject for itself a subject in itself and a subject for others that's how I make a character because that's you know. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing! It actually makes total sense. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, and I learned that in a lecture from the Chicano feminist theorist Norma Lacon was giving, and I was like, "Oh, that would work in a play." Um, and so that's just how I—that's how I know to do it. Um, but I lost my thread. You engage with Hegel, but oh, but so that I want, so I want the theory to be embedded in it, so yeah. that I wanted this idea of the commons, but so that's why I was like, oh, well, you have to like a commons has to feed everyone, so I like yeah. I have to talk. Well, if you're gonna do that, like you have to have a party, and you have to talk about the food, so then there has to be a chef, <laughs> and I didn't want it to be the Latina mom, <laughs> you know. I was like, and you know, I I knew I was not gonna do that. So I just, the person who's in the play who does that is her, her son, who's this, like, you know, shape who doesn't enjoy being there but does enjoy cooking. Yeah. <laughs> Can we talk more about the commons, about sort of the space that you create in Circa, you know, somewhat, you know, shared living conditions, you know, different expressions of precarity, but, like, politics of solidarity are built into the, the scene that you set, the mm-hmm. commons. Yeah. Well, one thing, it wouldn't have happened if you didn't have rent stabilization. And I guess the sort of autobiographical is I have a friend who lived, Augie Robles, who did the photographs and the video, lives, based, he lives where exactly the hood meets the hills. Like, his front yard is the back of the gated mansions in the community in Los Feliz, which is like the first sort of Hollywood, like Mary Pickford's mansion was there. Angelina Jolie now lives, you know, in that area with all her children. Um and he lives in a rent stabilized apartment that he's had lived in since in grad school at the, uh, at the American Film Institute for twenty years. Yeah. It's you know because it's three bedrooms and it's under two thousand dollars. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> yes. So like what those con- what, what rent stabilization particularly I've never lived all of my adult life every single place I've ever lived and including my childhood neighborhood have all been gentrified into basically non existence. Yeah. Um, so like San Francisco, Brooklyn, we were discussing. Um, probably what's only intact is like the neighborhood I lived in in Chicago for a year, but that was already kind of a mixed class neighborhood. Um, so that, um, so what that East Hollywood has, and also is that it is, it has rent stabilization. So what that allows for is like generations of people. So there are Armenian families that like the grandma to the grandson are right. there, um, and because it is the hub of Soviet Armenian or post-Soviets, rather, Armenians, they, they land there and then they move to Glendale. And Glendale has more Armenians than Armenia. Mm. <laughs> because they're all coming from all forms of the diaspora. Like, they're coming from Iran, they're coming from Lebanon, um, they're coming from Fresno, because that was, like, in the 19th, in the early 20th century, they were, Armenians referred to as Fresno Indians. Um, and that's why we have grape cultivation the way we do. It's Armenian. So, and that's what Fresno was the raisin capital of the world. <laughs> Just a little interesting fact. Um, so that all of that sort of pulls into, a, a, like, so then how do you, you don't have a commons, because I was tiring of the way people were talking about the commons, like, it was some metaphorical right, right. utopia, futurity, and, like, all that is some BS to me. Yeah, um, I love a little utopia. I mean, I mean I'd like a lot yeah. of it, <laughs> but I, I want it to be, I want to try it. Right. <laughs> I, like, I like a lot of it, but we have to, 
try, and also this is maybe this ties to the fact that like I was a a child, you know, in a Marxist Leninist ultra left sectarian organization, um, and I did believe like everyone often started conversations with when the revolution comes, and I thoroughly believed as a child that that was going to happen. And then dot, 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 whatever we thought would happen. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think it is all practicable. So let's try it. So they try it. Um, and they try it with, who, with the people who are there. Um, and then, like, you know, sort of any kind of mythopoetics, a stranger comes. Yeah. <laughs> and that is, you know, both the Armenian-Iranian grad student and the new undocumented boy. The, the ingenue of the text. <laughs> And it seems like what you're describing to you in terms of when you say try, it makes me think of the way your work is like working through so much and also sort of struggling through um, these questions and these ways of, you know, the embodiment, but also thinking about theorizing these embodiments. And so one of the themes that for me came up a lot was what I see as like a sort of ongoing tension in like Latin American and, and politics, political discussions in terms of like, you know, what is now even there, like somewhere like Brazil is called identity politics versus Marxist traditions and um, leftist politics. Um, it seems like that's a tension that you, it's almost like it's, I mean, it's not a tension in your work, I would no, say. No, I'm on Marxist side. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> and I feel like this is ex- this is actually something, I mean, everyone should be reading your work, if you know, but that's one of the reasons yeah. why, because it's yep. just already doing this. Um, but there is a sort of proliferation of identities I mean, right. it's sort of the opening scene, which is very long before, like, until Hadassah's arrival, is pretty much the first draft. That That is it, it is as I wrote it. And that was sort of writing without any kind of self-consciousness other than I wanted to r- see how many characters I could handle without having to break a scene. Because, um, you know, cause, because I didn't study in an MFA, like, I like to teach myself things. So my play puto is about arc. So that the whole thing is a very traceable arc. Um, and it's actually like the trajectory of a bullet. Because they're never straight. They're always sort of bent. And also, which is the, the head of an uncut penis, but that's neither here nor there for this oh, discussion. We can get to that shortly. Sure. Yeah. Um, and there I wanted to play with this long, drawn-out scene and all this like very varied ethnic particularity. Because Puto deals with the mass class of, of brown people in L.A., which is, mostly, which is Mexican and Central American. But this, I wanted to deal with, like, the rest of sort of immigrant third world L.A., which is people, you know, even, like, the white boy from Providence is an immigrant of sorts in it. Um, this, like, working class guy who doesn't fit. Um, and Zoraida, who's Nicaraguan, which is, you know, a negligible size community in L.A., but used to have its hub in San Francisco. But, like, there's a whole transit of people who, you know, undergrads who move there and stay on. And that's that's where she arises, or like someone who, like Themol, who has like total East LA politics, but doesn't live there, lives in Hollywood. So all of these that they're not they they aren't the right sort of tropic form of um, the LA, you know, immigrant population, and sort of everyone is one in the not quite right way. Um, and then this Argentine. Um, trans woman I, and I really wanted her there both to speak because um, at the time um, Professor Jennifer Ponce de Leon who's here was getting a master's in our history at UCLA um, and we know each other from when she was an undergrad at Harvard I mean she organized this massive international conference that took place in LA San Diego Tijuana and brought all these Brazilian and Argentinian and Chilean artists and scholars and political organizers um and there's also this brilliant documentary that she and I went to this really strange, very old gay bar in Orange County in Garden Grove called The Frat House, which is really close to Knott's Berry Farm. Um, and it's like, and um, it's now become mostly a Mexican and Vietnamese trans bar. Um, and my friend Dino Dinko, the photographer, was working, became the Monday night bartender there because we had just been there one Monday night. And he started showing films, and he showed this documentary about these sex workers who all had who all had taken over like one apartment building, um, and they were fighting the city because the city wanted to move their sort of where where they 
street walked into like a much more secluded, much more dangerous part of town, and they still wanted to be where they were. But also the internal strifes of like discipline. Um, the woman who runs the sort of leader of it is very sort of Stalinist in her like you will not do this, you will not do that, you will not do you know you will. But they also very much confront, um, and they had this great line, um, which sort of encapsulated. Um, Delphine or Fina, she's referred to in the play that she's like, I am not your fascist neighbor. Like, <laughs> because, you know, one can have a fascist neighbor in contemporary Buenos Aires. <laughs> like, so, and I was like, oh, that's a really, like, interesting formation. Um, and particularly, I wanted to have a trans character who wasn't formed by the contemporary discourse of trans identity um, that she's dis- distinct in that. But then still subject to, you know, transphobia and trans hatred and all in sort of in result in things that happen in the text. Okay. I have Okay, I'll read from this short play called Ni Madre, um, which is a three character play and it's a sort of historical fantasy. And it's about Malinche, who is the sort of originary Indian woman of New Spain who translated between Mayan and Nahuatl when Cortez arrived. And she visits California, um, specifically Los Angeles, specifically the Biltmore Hotel. And it was a commission for um, the Latino Theater Initiative, the Mark Tabor Forum of the Central Theater Group of Los Angeles. Um, And it is between Malinche, which I spell with an X instead of the C-H, and her, the um, slave girl she brings with her, who's a girl, and then the, the slave woman who works at the hotel, who is Nana. Um, and this is the scene where Nana and the girl are going to sleep on the floor, the tiled floor of the motel. Um, girl, tell me a story, Nana. Better yet, I'll tell you a secret. Girl. Is it about Doña Malinche? I know all those. She's a, she's as highborn as they come, a VIP, a Veracruz Indian princess. After her cacique daddy died, her mother married another cacique, and she was either stolen by traveling merchants or sold to them by her step cacique or her mother and brother. No one knows for sure, and she's not telling. She was sold twice into slavery before being one of 19 girls gifted to Cortez and to his men upon their arrival when she was just about my age. Nana. She was christened Mariana on the spot and given to one of the ship's captains. Her knowledge of Nawa and Maya served useful to the warfaring strangers, and she translated as they pummeled and dismantled the Triple Alliance, our temples, but never our systems and networks of gossip and valga el nombre te digo, girl. Girl. And then she had Cortez's son, el bastardo. Nana. That's unkind, girl. Yes, but not untrue. Then she married El Don and lives in wealth and luxury in the... S- in the seat of the vice royalty, the archdiocese of the Catholic Church, the holy office of the Inquisition, Mexico City, New Spain. Nana. Teotihuacan is far too old to be called new, no matter what the visitors say. Girl. Enough history. What about the secret? I have to wake up soon, before the sun does. I have to bring her food and sponge her in the morning, help her dress, and then clean the room, then go to catechism. Nana. I can time travel girl. Then after I have to return and see to her needs, which are many. You can what? Nana. Travel in and through time, mostly backward, but some forward. You could do it too one day, if you concentrate. Why, I can even make time disappear. Girl. Can you disappear too? Nana. If I could, I wouldn't be here. Girl. I don't believe you. I mean, soon it will be time to get up and time to feed her and time to fix her bed and clean up her mess in the room and time to help her dress and time to steal some of her copal perfume and left her backberries while she naps. How can you time travel when you can't even tell a good story? Nana, you are a very rude girl. Girl, I know. Una niña mala. Nana, good night, bad girl. Girl, good night, worse woman. They both go to sleep smiling. Thanks for sharing that. This does bring me to another question I had for you about how you uh, how you articulate different formations of kinship. Um, in your work, you have a lot of 
setups of, for maybe lack of a better word, families, but families that do not fit, you know, a nuclear family mold, like, and not even just chosen families, but a whole other way of of situating kinship. Yes. So the the, the Sandinistas referred to family when they had the revolution as any group of people who lived in solidarity under one roof. And so circas are sort of play like uh, they live under sort of multiple roofs mm. or have multiple doors but one roof. And how do you live in solidarity? And how do you have kinship? And then also like how do you survive things? Because no one survives anything alone. And I know like a lot of people who are single mothers of color who are not singular in that, that, that sort of... And I've been involved in, in sort of, I'm, I've been a nanny and I've also helped raise and, you know, and, and I enjoy babies very much. So I think there's there's this, as I grow older, there's the, a much more emphasis on young children in each of my plays. So I think in Circa, the sort of character at the matrix of it all is the girl Belly in some ways, even though n- nobody has like a lion's share of lines in that play. And in this one, I really wanted to play, yeah, between these sort of different kind of the Indian girl, the Indian woman, and the Indian crone figures of because they're so constant in Mexican iconography um, and so flat in some ways. So I wanted to shape them, and also that then also to put all power relations between women, which then for for good and bad, <laughs> because then then there's later that Malinche orders the Nana to whip the girl, and she does because. Those are how slave economies work. So yeah, so I think that yeah, and that's just I I mean, and I, uh, you know, I like to attend to people that way. I like, and also to not deny connectivity, but also not to sort of flatten it into a sort of mythic family or the kind of protected bourgeois nuclear family that right, sort of right. that was the gay marriage drive. Yeah, no, for sure. And this um, maybe I am taking up a. a us off course, which I'm happy to get back on. But I have recently become obsessed with the term that you introduced me to, which is red diaper baby. Um, And so I never knew that there was like this magical term that captured (laughs) if you grew up, you know, with communist parents, this, you know, is is the term that and you do sort of lovingly refer to yourself that way as well. Yeah. And it's so interesting to me because now, of course, Pete Buttigieg has just dropped out, and today's Super Tuesday, so I think this is why I can't help myself but ask this question. But, you know, last night I was watching Pete Buttigieg, who drops out of the Democratic uh, primary uh, in order to endorse Biden, followed by Klobuchar and Beto O'Rourke, also just endorsing Biden. And it made me think about how the right, uh, there was various right-wing publications that were really zeroing in on, well, maybe Pete Buttigieg sounds like a nice, good old centrist, but actually he's a leftist because he was a diaper baby, or a uh, <laughs> red diaper baby. And um, so I didn't know that his dad was this, like, you know, a uh, Notre Dame professor who had translated all of these uh, Gramsci works and even edited a collection about the transformational power of education in this Gramscian context, and apparently also was on the editorial collective for Boundary 2. So all of these things really rocked my world. And because Pete Buttigieg, you know, of, uh, of course, in my opinion, is not a leftist at all and um, talks about, you know, what he believed as, I think, obviously in response to Bernie Sanders, a democratic capitalism. So he constantly was re, while he was on the campaign trail, and perhaps why it should surprise no one that he has since endorsed Biden, is, you know, he countered that narrative about his familial upbringing about any kind of context that, you know, he did grow up with, even if it is an academic sense of leftist politics, which are sometimes, you know, academic politics can be very politically impotent, for sure. Um, But I just wanted to ask you, without pigeonholing you that, you know, the personal always informs the artistic, and obviously there's a much broader intellectual project there, but can you talk a little bit about about how that designation of red diaper baby or basically your upbringing informs, you know, this really sharp understanding of how you want to express solidarity. Sure. Um, Well, my one sort of play that I call an autobiography, which is about um, my birthday is July 18th. um, But I have this, I structure it as this, it's this um, boy's birthday and I make it on July 19th, which was also the Sandinista revolution. So that his birthday party gets eclipsed by this Latin American revolution. And I grew up in the 70s in Los Angeles, and my father had, we were, it was academic. He, we came to the U.S. because my father had a postdoc at UCLA. In, um, he was a neurophysiologist and a zoologist. 
So he was studying inner ear equilibrium of mud puppies. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> it was pretty cool. <laughs> we had them as pets. <laughs> they bark. That's why they, they're amphibians that bark. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, my backyard was used for, like, training to fight Nazis in the streets. Um, so, which is, you know, something has come a lot in the, come up a lot in the Antifa right. era. Um, but at the time, California had the largest membership of the American Nazi Party. And a lot of that got displaced, uh, you know, got run out literally by the left. And that sort of, and repopulated in the Pacific Northwest, which you see like in those sort of like the militia that took over that, that had that encampment, um, and so, like, I, I, my father was a Leninist. I remain one. Um, I don't have, although I don't think the organization that he, they eventually were in and that two of my siblings stayed in as, they, as we grew up it was interesting. It was silly, actually, and very poorly led. I still believe. Um, I still believe in revolution. And, in, and it's the only third thing I'm earnest about, <laughs> I guess. Um, I, I, although people always want me... Think, think that I'm joking or satirical or thinking that I really think that gender and sexual... I heard a friend of mine was giving a talk on my work um, and was saying that someone had countered and saying, oh, he really thinks the revolution is in gender and sexuality. And she was like, no, he doesn't. And, and, and no, I don't. I just give it a talk about... Uh, I don't. I'm, I'm pretty formal in 20th century, am I thinking of how the capital R revolution should come and is to come. So I don't um, feel a breakage with that. I feel like that's my lineage as much as, you know, I would say that, like, as a child, like, I got told to go back to Mexico as much as I got told to go back to, you know, to Russia. So it's very interesting to see all the sort of anti-Russian, which is, you know, profoundly, or the sort of the, you know, the anti-communism level that Bernie Sanders, who's not a communist. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So that, that, it's, you know... It, it's 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 very interesting. Also, that the, but now that like you know, but there's still we, so much red baiting. I mean, there's so much yeah. red baiting, but there's also a return discourse, like you know, sort of after the occupies and sort of the, the rebirth of the DSA, whom I have a very strong critique of, and um, of the Democratic Socialist Party, basically for what they did. I'm still mad at what they did in the '70s because I feel like they were, you know, they were the how the Democratic Party infiltrated. And, took the left to the center and the right. But, you know, that, but now that's part of discourse, like socialism and communism and, like, even just in memes. Right. And that is not, that's, like, very interesting and odd to me. Exciting, and I just, but I hope it's just not all sort of metaphor and ephemeral. We'll see. We'll I see. Guess. It's not, yeah. you know, every, like everywhere else not. in the world it's not. Yeah. Because also, you know, things are going down. In Brazil, things are really hot right now. Um, you know, in Bolivia, things are, you know, they just, they, they confirm what I knew, that there was no election fraud. Yeah. Evo Morales yeah. is, should be the president of right. Bolivia. Mm-hmm. Um, and meanwhile, he's hiding out in Buenos Aires. Mm-hmm. Partly thanks to the U.S. I'm yes. Sure. Right. Um, Good old. I was, oh, another question I had circling around, I think, um, we were saying about your father being an academic mm-hmm. and sort of how you index academia often in mm-hmm. the work. Which I, I really appreciate. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Because yeah, we're I'm a PhD we're, candidate. Yeah, we're so sad and hungry for <laughs> exactly attention. For, for, yeah, but attention. also how you see like just grad students as part of this, the worlds that you create. Um, um, it's really interesting to me how yeah I, invisible the, I guess the, grad students. The new thing I'm working on, Operation Space Maze, has a, a, a character who's now a Penn grad student. Oh, interesting. He's writing about like if like. In space, you know, what's that tagline in Alien? Like, in space, no one can hear you scream. Mm. But in space, can anyone hear you black? Is his question. Because, like, do you take the sort of, if you go to a place that does not have a history of enslavement, right. um, what d- does what does your blackness become? Mm-hmm. In an, and it's sort of my anti-Afro-pessimist project in the play. Mm-hmm. This is character Mac. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no. I mean, I think more of a jumping off question again, like, how do you see, yeah, how do you see your relationship to academia at this point? And I don't know if I see it as a relationship to academia. I, um, you know, because sort of before I was a writer, I, I was, I thought of myself as an intellectual because I was sort of raised to be one. Like, I was, my father did not find anything that was, you know, 
given to children in capitalist culture of interest. Like, so Disney films, no. You're going to, we, we took us weekly to see a Bunuel film, a Pasolini film. And Laurie Anderson concerts, right? And Laurie Anderson <laughs> concerts and punk Did games. he take you to see Land Without Bread? That Bunuel film? Where it's yes. Like, oh my God, that's, that must have disturbed <laughs> <Or> the you. the bus. <laughs> The Pasolini film that my mother took me out of, though, was Arabian Nights at the beheading. I was like, that's the thing that bothered well, you really? about this. really? What about other Pasolini films? Yeah. No, that was the only one. And it oh. was just with the decapitation. <laughs> I was like, that's the thing that bothered you all this time. I mean, I saw most of Almodovar's films with both of them as a child. It was interesting. <laughs> I watch Almodovar movies with my mom now. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I don't know if I would it's have. Lovely. Yeah, it is, actually. Because it's for them, too, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it does speak. And he's smartly, um, speak, he knows he's also having a conversation on multiple levels. Yeah. Um, so I think it's intellectuals. Um, and in some ways, like, I always, I often include like, an artist character. And that's really um, not because I think artists are special people that a lot of people think are magical because I don't. I think that's a way to be self-critical because I think we kind of we kind of suck and we need to like look at our excesses and our complicities um, particularly sort of ones who are really attached you know at the vein and mouth to the art market um, and in intellectual life because I think part of the sort of the anti-communism is and this is definitely a product of the Red Scare, is the way, the sort of shut down of intellectual discourse. You know, so we don't have, like, Noam Chomsky is not on our television sets often right. in the way that, like, in European, African, and Latin American markets, they know who their local and national and international intellectuals are. And Even right-wings now, right-wing ones that's at this right. point. Yes. But, you know, even Glenn Greenwald, who's based in Brazil, is, yeah. he's a factor exactly in Huge. Brazilian po- yeah, politics so much that he's is. getting you know threatened and fist fights on yeah yeah which um and and I guess maybe I long for that that we have some you know like because it's not that I to be super Leninist about it you know producing our into work is a point of production and it's an important one and and part of breaking the, its elitism and its provincialism and it, it and I you know, and its lack of utility in the world is letting us, like, have our say. <laughs> and I think study is important. I'm always, you know, I'm trying to convince my writing class that half of writing is reading and yeah. making them read things like Sally Gearhart's lesbian utopic sci-fi novel, The Wander Ground, where she has this, you know, all-women telepathic parthenogenic community that, that um, their go-between with them and straight society are the gentles, which is how she figures gay men. Wow. Yes. And they're just like, what? <laughs> and this is, came out in 1970? I'm like, yes. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> this is the canon. <laughs> yeah. It truly is a classic. Yeah. Yeah. So I, and I dislike the sort of, the way in which sort of a- academics either accept their provincialism mm-hmm. and their, their sort of ivy towering um, and don't make breaks into the culture at large. Well, one part of that, I have to uh, uh, refer to an earlier conversation we had about one of many reasons that the grad student union efforts here failed, for example, um, and the lack of solidarity among students and faculty and this kind of thing. And and Ricardo said something which you said very, it was very simply how you put it, but it, it kind of rocked my world. You just said, um, you know, for faculty to to be in alignment with us, they would have to recognize themselves as, as laborers, as workers. And I feel like there is um, a pretty concrete, like, uh, distinction or hole or gap or whatever between intellectual political class and not recognizing where their class politics, you know, fall, which... I don't know that that is the same elsewhere. I think it is something kind of unique to the U.S., even yes. more so than, like, Canada, for example. Well, also because intellectuality in other places is not limited to that professoriate. It, right, right. Like, so, you know, you get on right. a subway in any third world capital and someone, some unionist is talking politics in, in theoretical ways mm. and, you know, and can, you know, ream quote quoted paragraphs of, Cabral or Marx or knows their Fanon, yeah. Um, and that's not, it's not necess- It's not. It, it may be academically earned, but it's not all academic. Um, and that is very closed off. We don't have. Yeah. I mean, Chicago has a feel of that kind of working class intellectual culture still. Like there's. I mean, I lived there during their teacher strike. There, 
and that was impressive. Mm. Particularly all the various sort of leftist and feminist sectarian things going on. Um, I wonder if you could maybe tell us what's exciting you now, inspiring now, you know, in terms of like anything, the culture, what you're reading or watching. Um, I really, and I didn't expect to, I really, because um, I'm like a naysayer on both Pose and Vita. Mm. Oh. Even though I know Vita, like Rich Vegas, who wrote the short story, it's based on, is a friend and is a homie and represent. Um, but I find them like, in Vita, I find it frightfully neoliberal. Um, and Pose, I just find it so revisionist of like, we didn't all. We are not all dead. You could ask us what it was like, and it wasn't like that. Just that it's wa- so watered down. What? Can yeah, you be and specific? the sort of the anesthetizing of the poverty. Right. Like mm. people in those houses were very poor. Like they were stealing things because they did not have. Yeah. And mm. it seems like the like just the, the you know I didn't get far in the, the first season. The only well, thing they got right was Indochine. And like that moment where like oh that was the very, restaurant yeah and the restaurant that had a DJ it was like one of the first that like a restaurant that had a DJ that like mixed like club people with society people mm. and to ha- to hire a, like a, a black trans woman that like that was hostess. that that made sense um, they got that right but so many other things and they could just ask like right. a bunch of those you know it's clearly modeled on extravaganzas just ask them they're all there. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. or they live in LA and ask Eddie X, you know, one of the DJs who was, you know, an Alvin Ailey dancer and a member of Kansas. So I think that, but I really love on Netflix, there are two shows um, Hentified, which just started. Oh, yeah, I heard about it. Um, who are these? It's this family with, um, they're trying to save their taqueria um, and gentrification. But I like it. All the heroes and all the villains are brown. So Wilmer Valderrama plays the Latino realtor. And then there's a very butch femme lesbian couple that I'm about. I am about. And um, it just, and it's, and it's funny. And it's actually funny. Uh, I think that is, I think it's great. Um, and then the, another one is, um, what is it called? On My Block? It's another Netflix show that's much more like young adult. And it's also set in L.A., but it's in a very, like, it reminds me of the L.A. I grew up in. It is both working in middle class that is brown and black, that, like, has, you know, intergenerational pot use, um, a healthy discussion of, like, where does one masturbate in a house with, with as many people? That's what we all <laughs> That has, know. like, you know, gang members and kids in AP classes. I, thought, I think those are, like, useful representations. Perhaps we could close off with one more reading. I'll read this little thing because it, it's like a little manifesto I read. It was at the American Studies Association when they had it at the Biltmore Hotel, which my last play was set in. Um, and Juana Maria Rodriguez, that's uh, my homegirl, and she asked me to write it. And it was these manifestos. They wanted manifestos. So this is a proclamation of, by, and on negation. One, I am not an intersectionalist. I prefer Stuart Hall and Hazel Carby's leaning on Althazer and Gramsci and their society structured in dominance and Hortense Spiller's formulation of the imbrication, imbricating like what Spanish tiles on roofs do to each other in the permacolonial architecture of Maya Le. For me, intersectionality feels like essentialism by other means and positions social and cultural critics as traffic cops. Two, I never want to be any kind of cop, though I do love cop porn. Three, (laughs) I am not a queer theorist, though most of my best friends are. I'm still fucking around with gay liberation, Miele, Rubin, Hokengem, Vatig. Four, I am not a post-colonialist and find each and every day a reason to return to anti-colonialist thought. Five, I am an L.A. Mexican who is tired of Chicano grammars of struggle. Decolonization is a noun. It is the colonizing, colonized seizing the state, usually violently, Bringing your abuela's tablecloth to your college campus does not mean that you have decolonized that space. I know that makes me status, but I don't care. Stop trying to make the gerund at decolonizing a thing. Like fetch, it's not going to happen. Six, I am an LA Mexican who is a Caribbeanist and a Europeanist by reading and training. That makes me neither a wannabe black or wannabe white. Seven, I hate monogamy, capitalism, institutional whiteness, empire, and being called a cultural worker. Because when somebody calls me that, they always want my labor for free. Eight, I don't hate on heterosexuality and find it far less normative than the phrase heteronormativity allows. I believe the hundreds of straight men I have slept with would concur. Well, at least a hundred. 
Nine, I'm not queer, though I do use the term to describe the grouping of perverse us. Queer for me is, as my friend Andy Spieldender said back then, like a leather jacket I tried on during the Act Up era, an aesthetic that just doesn't, didn't fit. I am old gay, language in the black and brown gay club, dive bar, drag den, drug den, rave and underground house scene, which meant then butches and femmes and switches of varying hues and genitalia and trans deformed the term was in use. As a child in the life, all I ever wanted to be was a legendary child of the life. And now as a grown-ass man, that life is gone. It's okay. I loathe sentimentality and nostalgia, and though AIDS, misogyny, trans hate, prisons, gentrification, homophobia, racism, capitalism, and technology are thoroughly and totalizingly to blame, theories that just find new ways to assign such blame bore me. My fellow urban race sexuality criminality theorists don't ever fucking bore me. 10. I'm an internationalist and a localist, not a transnationalist, an anti-imperialist and a Marxist in the first and last instance. Wonderful. Yeah, I think that has to be how we end. Thank you so much. Thank Ricardo, you. Ricardo, thank super you. Fun. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Maria.